call me old man waves. Damn you, old man! Wade. And welcome to the Old Man Wade Show. I am your host, the God of Stub and the Lord of Laughter, Old Man Wade. And we got a returning guest, a favorite. Uh, why don't you state your name and where you're from? My name is Steve Van Sampson. I am from the planet Earth uh, with all the other all the other human-based life forms. Um, also known as Lancaster, Massachusetts. I mean, if you really need to be that specific. I mean, I'll be that specific. I mean, What's up, everyone? I, I write horror books, and I'm a guy. I mean, are you really from planet Earth, though? What's that? Are you really from planet Earth, though? I mean, look, as far as I know, I mean, I'm pretty sure, I, you know, I have my suspicions that perhaps the shed has something in it, like, underneath the shed, and maybe, you know, there's a spacecraft down there, but, like, I've never had the balls to actually dig it up, so. Don't worry, one day you'll be, um, chilling, doing nothing, and this alien language will call to you. And you walk over and go, what is that? And you'll find out you have superpowers. Um, you say that with such confidence that it's making me think like you know something I don't know. Of course not. Why would I do anything like that? He's discovered. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> God uh, damn it. <laughs> you know, with you, hey. Did you like that movie? Uh, which one? Um, Man Steel? Uh, Brightburn. Oh, I, I actually didn't see it. Really? <laughs> I shouldn't be shocked because it's not really something that, that people would be running out to go see. Well, you know, it's funny. I actually love James Gunn. Uh, I've actually, so, I think, you know, at this point, James Gunn's super popular because of Guardians, but, like, um, I, I loved him uh, since uh, this movie called Slither. I don't know if you know that movie at all, but uh, it actually starred Nathan Fillion, and um, it was like early 2000s or something and it's just this bizarre hilarious over the top uh like old monster movie uh alien monster movie this alien falls to earth and there's like slugs and they invade people's brains and and it's just awesome michael rooker is the bad guy in it and um it's it's this really really fun movie and i love that movie and so ever since slither i was like really always following James Gunn. And actually, I got to see I got to see James Gunn uh, live because he had a movie uh, called Super. Do you know that movie? Uh, was that the one with uh, Dwight Schrute from The Office? Yes. 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 <laughs> it sounds <Ripley>. squishy! <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Ellen Page and uh, Kevin Bacon's in it and Liv Tyler's in it. And it's just uh, such a weird friggin' movie, but I love it. And uh, it kind of came, like, out right after Kick-Ass, and it was sort of like the same idea of what would happen if a real person went out and tried to be a superhero with no superpowers and everything was super violent and everything. But anyway, uh, I got to see, me and my wife saw uh, a showing of that when it was, like, kind of playing some, like, uh, festival circuits. And uh, we saw in Boston, and James Gunn was actually there. And it's really, really funny, because this was before Guardians, obviously. It was a couple years before Guardians, or three years, maybe. And, like, it really felt like James Gunn was kind of winded down. Like, he was talking about, you know, what a difference it was making Super versus Slither, because Slither was, like, to him, so big budget. And it had all these trailers, and it had all these sets, and it had all this stuff. And, and you know, Super was just, like, you know, essentially back to his, like, trilling the roots, almost. Like, it was just nothing. And, uh... It's just really funny because a few years later he became James Frick God. Yeah. With Guardians. <laughs> but anyway, so my point is, I guess, I don't know. I, I am a fan and I would like to see it, but I just didn't get to. It's funny, so I went to go Google the uh, the movie because I felt like I'd seen it, but <clears throat> I haven't. And I was like, is that Elizabeth Banks? So she, so <laughs> James got working with the same people. Yeah. Uh, he loves, you know, he's always got Michael Rooker. He also, um, uh, tries to fit Nathan Fillion and stuff, and that's from Slither. Elizabeth Banks was also in Slither. So that doesn't surprise me. You know, when I saw that she was going to be in this, it's like, ah, oh, cool. You know, he's gone back to one of his alums. Yeah. And I'm looking at his um, IMDb now, and I'm like, yeah. And it's funny, because um, Nathan Fillion was actually in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. 
Like, he did a mocap thing. He's like one of the prisoners. You just can't tell it's him. Yeah, it's freaking hysterical. But I, but, I was, but who doesn't love Nathan Fillion, though? Like, I, I would... I know. <clears throat> I'm actually kind of so, disappointed we so won't be getting his... Uh, fingers up his nose. What did you say? He, like, puts his fingers up the prisoner's nose and, like, his fingers, like, worm into the guy's brain. So <laughs> that's the character that Nathan Fillion played. It's just this, like, random prisoner guy. Of course he does. I'm kind of disappointed he's not going to be, um, what's his name, Nate, Nate, um, Nathan Drake in the Uncharted movies, if those ever get done anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like, everybody wanted that like, 10 years ago. I don't know, at this point, is he too old? I don't know, who knows. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I don't know, I feel like there's probably not going to get made, but hey, you know, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, but enough of that. Let's talk about you, man. You just finished the book. I did. I did. I, I finished the book, but it's not. It's uh, it's it's still uh, you know, in uh, m- moldy clay form on my computer. But you know, it does it does feel good to finish a book. If if anybody's out there and you know you're thinking about writing or um, you started and uh, you know you can't seem to finish, like it really, like you know, my advice is to just push through if as much as possible if you can, like because it's one thing to. Um, doubt yourself, uh, even if it's like every single day as you're doing this, you know, you know, I don't know if this is good enough. I don't know if this is good enough, but, and that's okay. And I would say that that's, that's from a lot of people, because I'm not that experienced, but a lot of people I've talked to who have been writing professionally for years, they say, you know, that's very normal. It's okay. Like you're gonna, you're gonna wonder all the time if you're good enough, whatever, but the problem is if you let that little voice stop you, you can't let you can't you can't let it win. You can you can let it check you, and and that's good because you don't want you know to become you know too cocky or you don't want hubris to take over to the point where you think like oh I'm so great I'm doing all this fantastic stuff. It's like you know there's a point where you start you know getting feeling you I I could I don't feel that way. I mean I I think maybe people could feel that way. If, but it's good to it's good to have that little check, uh, but just just don't let it win. You know, um, push through, just finish it. And it, I think it's better to uh, move on to the next thing and just finish it and realize that the previous thing you just finished wasn't perfect. And instead of trying to make it perfect for you know ten years, twenty years, or something like I know I know people who you know. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm good friends with this wonderful writer, Tom Deedy. This guy is awesome. He's uh, he's won a Bram Stoker Award for for the novel um, Haven. Uh, he's he's really a great guy. He he. It took him, I think he said, and you know he can punch me in the face if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, I think he said it took him like nine years or more to write that book. He had had it in his head forever, but then he won the Stoker. So. But, and for those who don't know, the Bram Stoker Awards are essentially like winning an Oscar for horror writing. That's the that's the biggest award that you can win. So, and he's from Halston. He's a great guy. So, like, I mean, that's insanely awesome. You know, he finally he finally got it got that finished, and it got you know he beat it up to the point where he was happy. And hey, it won won a Stoker. But I think that. Um, after that, he started pumping stuff out, and and that's awesome. So when once he once he got that to that point, and he's like, oh my god, oh my god, like that was that felt so good, that was finished. Now we gotta we gotta start like you know picking up the pace a little bit and start finishing, get get to more of the ends, you know. It uh, it really it, that first one is the hardest though, it really is. But I think that it's awesome. It's an awesome feeling. So yeah, so my third my third book right now is uh, it's kind of. Separate from my first two, my first two, uh, which I've talked about on the show before, Bone Eater King and Marrow Dust are like African vampire post-apocalyptic horror stories. And this this one is a novel, and it's actually longer than the other two were. Um, this one's about, uh, it's just under 100,000 words right now. Um, and that's a first draft, though, so, you know, we're not done with it. But, um, hey, it's uh, it's different. It's, it's more like a fantasy thing, so it's totally separate. And I, I wanted to do, like, dark scary fantasy that was like pretty violent with monsters and stuff so it's it's, it's kind of like low fantasy um but i don't know i had fun writing it and I, I, i'm telling you man every single time i sit down with this 
you know, it's like I, I, I run the gamut of emotions of, hey, this is pretty good. Maybe this whole thing's worthless. Like that all happens like in this, like every single time you sit down, <laughs> it just it just is kind of how it is. Uh, but, you know, you do build some confidence. And so at this point, saying, say, this is actually the fifth book I've written. The first two I wrote are like just sitting on a shelf. I'm not sure what to do with um, it. You do, you do start to get a little bit more confident, but that voice never goes away. <laughs> at least for me. And I, I, know, I know a lot of people who say that too, that they're always questioning whether or not it's worth it, whether or not they, they have any right to be doing this, but yet they just keep going. And eventually you kind of, I think, learn to not shut that voice up, but to just sort of ignore it a little bit and be like, well, yeah, maybe it's not worth it. Uh, I'll make the next thing better then. You know, make, make whatever you're working on as good as you can, but just realize that no amount of beating it up is ever going to make it perfect. And eventually you start to look like, you know, Rocky, because, you know, eventually the beating up, like, starts to hurt it. Like, you know, if, if you beat it up too much, <laughs> it was got an eye swollen shut and, you know, all this stuff. I didn't hear no bell. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I dig it, though, man. Like I, like, I work on projects, and even with the podcast, like, sometimes I'm like, fuck, this just isn't good enough. And, like, I get discouraged. Possibly, um, let's see, we have seven days out the week. Nine days out the week, I get discouraged with all of my projects. But what's funny? Yeah. But what's funny about it is once um, I hit, once I set up the laptop, set up the microphone, and I get myself situated, like all that. It's funny, all that doubt disappears. Or when I'm writing, yeah. when I'm writing an article or whatever, I start writing, and it's like everything else kind of just goes away. All my insecurities, all of my self doubt. Once I'm actually in the process of being creative, everything just disappears, and I kind of just I vibe with it. But but you're right that voice of self-doubt never really actually leaves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get in the zone, for sure. I mean, like anything, you know, and uh, when you're in that zone, it's like you're just going, you're just, you're just creating, like you said. And that is really the best possible feeling. I, I think that's kind of like the best of it all, is when you can get to that point and you're in the zone, you're like just you like time goes by you don't realize how much time is going by you know you look up and it's like holy crap i wrote all those words and holy crap you know all these hours have come by and i didn't realize it that's that's great like that's like magic time you know but um you can't always be like that you know you're gonna have your days oh yeah frustrated and just like stare at the keyboard but you know Hopefully those get less and less, but who knows. But you're right, though. Like Especially like when you write yourself into a wall and you're like, well, fuck, I have no idea what I'm going to put next. And for me, when I get like that, I kind of just, I go, you know what? I'm going to skip ahead to about maybe another chapter and I'll come back to this later. And then when I usually, when I come back to it, I go, okay, now that I have written what's ahead of it, I know what to do going forward. So for me, that helps. But um, what? Do, so how do you deal with it? Like if you ever write yourself into a corner or anything like that? Um, oh, so, so actually I have a really appropriate answer. Uh, so, uh, in writing my second vampire book, uh, Mirror Dust there, um, I wrote about, I don't know, 15,000 words or something. Like it was a decent amount. It wasn't nothing of the beginning. And the very, the very opening chapter of that book is this like weird, bizarre dream sequence because it is a sequel and uh, I wanted to start in a really disorienting way that, like, sort of harkened back to the first book, but would put you in a spot where you kind of weren't sure where, how long after the first one this was taking place. But there's, like, this, this moment of this dream. So the dream I liked. Okay, so I'm like, okay, chapter one's fine, because it's kind of disconnected. But then after that, there was this whole thing. And the character, like, starts off on this mountain in, uh, in Kenya. And, and it was like, I, I'm writing and I'm writing and it ended up being like three chapters worth and I was still on the stand mount. And so I'm reading it and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, okay, I am bored. <laughs> I'm bored with this. I, I think that I should have wrapped this up sooner. I, I don't think I should be starting chapter four still on the mountain. I think that something has 
has gone wrong. And so I, uh, you know, in, and this is not necessarily what I've heard from a lot of, you know, professional writers. That a lot of people will say, um, uh, write, go forward, don't look back. That's what they say. They say, save the editing for, for the second draft and just book it to the, fi- to the finish line. And that's how you finish books. And when I experienced this, I had heard that. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, no, I guess I should just keep going. And I really wrestled with it for a long time. And I ended up taking about 5,000 words out of what I had written. Really? Uh, Which is like a short story. I mean, most short stories in anthologies, uh, like if you look at, if you're writing for open calls and stuff from different anthologies, most ask for about like four to 6,000 or 7,000 max words. So if you have a 5,000 word piece, that's a, that's a good, solid short story. So I, I ripped that out. And, uh, and I, so I kept the dream part, and I kept the beginning of, of what came next. And then I was like, okay, two or, th- two or so chapters about I just I just delete it. And I always save them aside just in case. But um, I took it out of the main file. And, uh, yeah, I was like, you know, even though people say don't look back, don't edit until you're done, and the reason why people say that, to be fair, is because it is uh, kind of a trap. So if you're doing too much editing as you're going, it does sort of slow you down to the point where you're making no progress uh, or virtually no progress. And, you know, you do need to get to the end and then make your changes. But my argument at that particular moment because I did feel like I wrote myself into a corner. A corner. I'm like, I don't like where I'm at in this. I'm t- you know, five thousand words past where I was interested, and like to what even comes next. I'm not even sure, and uh, all this stuff. All there was like so much doubt. I was like, well, if I continued with this, it would be like a tangent universe. It's not like I could do what you just said and go back and fix it later, knowing what comes knowing what comes next later or something, figuring out that part. Because that, if, if I, looking back at it now, if I hadn't changed it at the beginning, it would have been a different book. It would have been like an entirely different book. Because my plans for what would have followed those extra two chapters that I took out were completely different, completely, utterly, totally, totally different than what I ended up doing. And I couldn't see it at that point, I had to remove those and rethink it and be like, all right, well, since I didn't like being on the, you know, the mountain for so long, you know, I got to take out all this stuff. So now I got to figure out a new way of getting them off the mountain quicker and making it more interesting and having like a more, you know, explosive thing happen that's, you know, this exciting, interesting thing or whatever. So that's, that's what happened to me. Um, so for Marrow Dust, I I, uh, I definitely painted myself into a corner, but I just went against the grain and said, you know, I know all these, you know, writers who I respect, and they've been doing it forever. They all say don't do this, but you also got to do what's right for you. You know, you, you have to just kind of feel it out, and uh, that was right for me at that particular time. So that's how I handled that. Anyway, well, it kind of makes sense, but um, it's always uh, one of those things where you have to take. Um, everyone's information with a, you know, not necessarily with a grain of salt, but just because it doesn't work for you now doesn't necessarily mean it won't work for you later or taking bits and pieces of everything that's going on and actually making it a thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I've, uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, Finding Forrester. And, oh, and one of the things. Hmm? You're the man now, dog. You're the man now, dog. But, um, what the the- oh, dog. <laughs> Punch the damn keys. But um, one of my favorite mo- um, parts of that movie where he was talking about the process of writing, he goes, the first one, the first draft you write with your heart, and then the second one you do with your mind. And it kind of made sense because the first time like, I, um, I start writing something, I'm like, I'm like, I've got all this passion in it. And I'm like, yeah, I got this, I got this. But then when I go back and read it again, I'm like, this makes sense, but I definitely need to reword that and um, go to thesaurus.com and stop using uh, this word this many times. Yeah. And let me tell you, that is um, the the source dot com has become like my best friend over the last like few months. I use it, I use it all the time. I I mean, I wrote you know song lyrics for years, and I would always go to the source dot com. You know, 
You can also go to rhymezone.com if you write lyrics. That's that was my best friend as well. <laughs> Rhyme zone? Rhyme zone. It just tells you what words rhyme with, with the word. You type in, you know, you know, rambunctious and it'll tell you if there's any word that rhymes with rambunctious. Or you know <laughs> It's just of all the words you could have come up with rambunctious. Probably not too many, but like sun, it'll be like fun, gun, you know, all whatever. I dig it though. But hey, let's um on top of the book, books, plural, uh, Marrow Dust and the Bone Eater King, actually, the Bone Eater King and then Marrow Dust, which are both available on Amazon.com, if I'm not mistaken. That is very true. And they will uh, they will officially, uh, and I believe we announced this last time we were on, because uh, I, I work with Rough House Publishing, I should mention that too, and we did have an episode with you, I think in July, and we were both on Derek Rook uh, and myself. The Rook from Rough House Publishing. And uh, we, we are going to be uh, re-releasing uh, my first two books. Uh, there's gonna, they're going to be Rough House editions that are going to be uh, super deluxe hard co- uh, like hardcover with illustrations and a bunch of extras. So we're going to give them the full um, Rough House treatment because that's kind of a thing where we love to give people uh, extras with the, the book itself, and that's usually comic books. But these are going to be the first foray into... Uh, prose work um so we're going to start off with uh re-releasing my books and there's going to be some more stuff to come but um some some more original stuff i'm not going to talk about that but there is going to be uh sh- should be out by next june the the deluxe edition of bone eater king which i think we might be calling the apex edition that's what we were kind of throwing around uh i like that for our flip, but, i like but, that. Um, apex edition is dope i like the like like the way that sounds Cool, because it's like oh, the Apex Predator, right? And this yep. Predator world is the series. So anyway, yeah. So that that super excited about. That's going to be freaking amazing, and uh, it'll be really really cool to see see these these things get like some some new life, some new blood pumped into these uh, these things. Because I you know I, I put out the Bone Eater King in 2017, and I haven't really come out with uh, anything significant since. I've had some short stories appear in collections, but I've just been working on this third book for for like. Almost two years, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of like, you know, like your book and stuff like that, you'll be at a uh, Rock and Jock, Rock and Shock, excuse me, Rock and Shock, uh, October twelfth through thirteenth. Uh, so actually, uh, Rock and Shock, yes, I'm going to be there the eleventh as well. Um, so the the show actually runs eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth of October, and that's in Worcester, Mass, at the at the uh, DCU Center. And uh, this is uh, my favorite con that i've ever done i love rock and shock it was the first con i ever did i did it for two years with the new england horror writers with my buddies uh over there and they they let me cut my teeth on the con scene and i really really loved it and and this year 2019 i uh have now gotten to do uh, one con with uh derek rook of rough house and at the rough house publishing booth and i'm going to do it for a second time here and that's re- really exciting um Really, really stoked to do that. I had a really good time with Derek last time. And uh, and actually, uh, so Rock and Shock is going to be awesome, but also, oh, and there's like an incredible amount of guests that are going this year, too. Because Rock and Shock kind of looked like it was done. I got to I gotta be honest. Really? It's, they've been doing it for like 11 years or something, I think. And last year, it was like half the size that it usually was. They cut it down, and their the guest list wasn't quite as... Uh, it, as impressive, no offense to, to the guests who came out, obviously, but um, th- th- it was it, it all sort of felt a little bit like maybe this is winding down, and the scuttlebutt wasn't great, and all the stuff, and and then all of a sudden they they come back this year, and it's a full size convention, and they have uh, amongst other people, they have Bruce Campbell is going to be there, and Bruce Campbell of the Evil Dead fame, and you know he just he just did uh, Ash versus Evil Dead. Um, which was like the revival show that was like a sequel to the Evil Dead movies. And, uh, you know, he's in Burn Notice for like seven seasons, um, which was a top-rated show in USA for at least the first five years, I think, it was on. Yep. Uh, but Bruce Campbell is awesome. He's also written three books, and uh, uh, he was in a great show in the early 90s. I loved Briscoe County Jr. I don't know if people remember that. It was like a cowboy show with like some sci-fi elements. And um, anyway, it, I, I love this guy. I've always loved this guy. He's he's like a geek god, like by far. And uh, 
and he's going to be a rock and shock. It's just so crazy. So that's awesome. I actually got to meet him, meet him one time in the past, like for his first book tour. He came around and he was in Boston. But um, yeah, like some uh, a bunch of people from Twin Peaks are going to be there, and uh, Kane Hodder is going to be there, and he was like one of the he, he's he's kind of like the most beloved person to play Jason in the Friday the Thirteenth movie. So he wasn't the original, but um, he's a guy who kind of invented the slow breathing. The slow breathing. Yeah, when Jason will just stand there and his his shoulders rise and fall, and he's just breathing. Uh, that's like yeah. Kane Hodder came up. That's pretty damn cool. I never thought, I never knew that. But again, I'm also uh, a novice when it comes to a lot of like horror things. Like I know the classics and I know a lot of things, but like you actually, for you, this is a passion. So you study this stuff. You know all. Of, you know more than just like the names of like the populars, like um, Robert Unglin and um, Bella Lugosi. Like you know, like the um, like one of my favorites. I think you said was um, it was a woman who designed the creature from the Black Lagoon. So it's, it's called The Lady from the Black Lagoon. Oh, you yeah. go. Millicent Patrick? Does that make sense? Millicent, yeah, so Millicent Patrick is the woman, I guess. She's the um, special effects artist who, who came up with the costume and fabricated that that costume. And it's it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, if you're if you're going back to the old days, because that's really where I, I sort of get passionate is like the, the really, really old days of, of horror and stuff like that, uh, like back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon is among the most iconic of movie monsters by far. And I don't, I don't think anybody would, would argue that point, but yeah, it, it is this weird thing where like, uh, yeah, do you know this, this was done by a woman, uh, uh that's not a typical role for, for a woman to have played, especially in the forties. Cause that came out, I, that, that might've been the fifties, the creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, I, I think that might have been 51 or something like that, that movie. Because um, the other ones were all from the 30s. Uh, like, Dracula and Frankenstein were both 31. Uh, so, yeah, Creature Creature was actually 54. But still, in, you know, 54, this was not this was not an industry that, that women were known for. Actually, um, going all the way back, um, oh, like Lon Chaney Sr., um, Lon Chaney Sr. was the guy who played um, Phantom of the Opera in the, the silent Phantom of the Opera. So it's kind of like the one that you think of where his nose is like, you know, a, like a pig nose. It's like an upturned nose. Like that phantom you can picture in your head that's black and white. Yeah. That's a silent movie. Uh, but that was that was from like 26 or something or 28. And that I think 26. But that was, um, that was in a time when men almost exclusively you know, were, were like, even, even, I mean, if you keep going back, men always played women. Like, like Shakespeare's day, there were no women actors. You know, men played the women all the time. So it's sort of like that old tradition even, where yeah, there were women, obviously, but uh, in the 20s, but like, you know, acting. But like, Monster, like, there, he did all of that makeup himself. That was the tradition. That was like the old, old tradition. It was the stage tradition. Where people, if there was any makeup to put on, if you're, you know, you know, if it's beauty makeup, if you're playing a woman, or if it's anything at all, if there's a scar or whatever, they were not makeup people. There was not a team of hair and makeup people. The actors actually put that on themselves. So that makeup where you can picture that, that ugly phantom, uh, he did that himself. And not only did he do it himself, he designed it and figured it out, and nobody even knew how he did it. Damn. It was just like a trade secret where he would do everything himself. So that was like still happening in the twenties, and then you had in in the the Universal Cycle in the thirties, which contained like the Bela Lugosi uh, Dracula, and you had you know the Boris Karloff Frankenstein, and like all those. The 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 makeup artist that is sort of historically remembered is Jack Pierce, and he was um, he was like Universal's guy. And he was the one who came up with the look for Dracula, the look for Frankenstein, and all that stuff. And even though Frankenstein didn't have all that much in the ter- in terms of like you know prosthetic makeup necessarily compared to what we see today, um, you know it's kind of just simplistic. That was still uh, a pretty big deal for the time, and it's also flawless. I mean, if you look at that Frankenstein, you cannot at all tell where makeup starts and ends. Like the like it's it's just perfect it even though it's simple it looks like he is that creature 
So, so you know, Jack Pierce is, is remembered, like, by far. And then you have the creature from the Black Lagoon, it's like, yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody remembers who did that. It ends up being, uh, oh, by the way, it was not only it was, uh, was it a talented makeup artist, it was, uh, it was a woman. That's huge, too. So, yeah, that, uh, the, the, uh, the lady from the Black Lagoon, that's, that's what we said the title was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, and, and we should mention the, the, uh, the author, too, which is uh, Mallory O'Meara. Mallory O'Meara. Well, you know, I really want to read the book. I, I just haven't gotten around to it. Well, you know, we're, we're adults. You have uh, chilling, um, and you're married. So, like, you know, in a full-time job, and on top of, like, your creative um, endeavors, which, which you have many. So, you know, kind of life kind of gets in the way and stuff like that. And, um... But uh, you know that actually uh, the topic you're talking about the um, like knowing your knowing the source material and knowing your craft and stuff like that that also brings up um, a conversation we had maybe about two or three months ago about writing about cultures that aren't necessarily your own. Oh uh, yeah, and because I remember we were talking about this, and, and um, actually if you go back to one of the older episodes, your first um, appearance on the show. Where we discussed you doing the um, vampires in Africa, mm-hmm. and, I, and I love the fact that you actually did your due diligence to really look into the landscape of Africa, uh, the culture, and everything else. So it's not just like you; it wasn't like you were just what's the word? You weren't you weren't culture vulturing. You know what I mean, for lack of a better term, because some people will take these. Uh, go ahead. I like that culture vulture. Yeah, it's. You're not one, of, so you know what I mean. Like, so when you're writing about something, you're not necessarily doing it to sell a buck. Like, you're also, which you know, everyone does it for, like you know, obviously for monetary gain. But you're not actually just doing this because, like, you know, I'm going to uh, steal from from a steal from a culture because I know it sells, which is an issue I have with um, a lot of uh, comic books. Or when like instead of actually creating new characters you're like oh we'll just make this character black we'll make this character gay we'll make this character white and this is like you could just create new characters but um but back to the point at hand like we were having a discussion about this and you had um a question about it in general because you felt that like you didn't want to you didn't want to be offensive by writing about something right right um, I think that for me, it, the, the line that I walked with those books is, especially the first one, is uh, I, I'm not seeing anybody write this. Uh, I want to write vampires like nobody's ever seen. I want to do uh, African vampires. I want to write black vampires. I don't want to have it be like, oh, it's set in Africa, but you know, I, I have a white guy protagonist or whatever, because I'm a white guy. I have to write white guys, right? Like. No, I want it to be a book about Africa starring Africans, like it had to be. And so everybody's from there, and, you know, that was, like, the point. So, like, I had to learn a lot about the, the people there. And, and it really was this this walking of this line of, well, I want to do this. I want to help representation. I'm all about that. But do I have any fucking right to do this? You know, because that was the voice in the back of my head. Are people going to say, I'm a fraud? I'm just, you know, doing it to, to, like you said, to be a culture vulture or whatever, to sell books or whatever. And so, so that, that was the voice in my head the whole time. So I said, no, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to do it. But I want to do it as, as right as I possibly can by learning as much as I can. So, like, I did a deep dive into, like, into the Maasai that was like a big thing. Like I knew I wanted one of the characters to be Maasai, and uh, I learned a ton about their culture. I learned, um, you know, I you know what, what, the character, the character, the main character who in the first book who is Maasai is like um, one of one of the things is you don't really learn his name, and he's he's like an amnesiac, and uh, he doesn't really remember so. One of the other characters kind of just kind of makes up a name for him and kind of uses that, but it's sort of an insulting thing. And then partway, uh, the other character realizes that um, he doesn't really deserve the mean name, and so uh, you know because he's sort of proven proven himself. Uh, so she she starts calling him Morna instead, not Moron, but M O R A N, which is a Maasai word for warrior, and 
um, I learned about how, like, you know, their manhood rituals go, and, and basically how, you know, this is a nomadic tribal culture, and they, you know, for, you know, they're basically, uh, they're, they're cattle farmers. They live out on the plains of, you know, Tanzania and various other countries. They, they roam, and, and they just, they herd these cattle, but they herd these, yeah, these cattle, these cows, but like, <laughs> I mean, the thing is that their culture is is very intrinsic with the lion, and for for centuries, they uh, they battled the lion because guess what? The lion eats their cows, so it became a thing where they're like, well, you know, to become a man, what you got to do is you got to go out there and you got to go kill yourself a lion by yourself, and if you come back having killed the lion, you're a freaking celebrity. They have like a parade for you, and they're like everybody's you know super excited, and you're like the celebrity of the day, and you become a moron. And um, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, uh, but it is spelled M O R A N. But uh, so yeah, the, the uh, for years this is what happened. But then now modern day, like conservation is a thing. You can't just go out, go around killing lions, you know, whatever. And you know the the. The government said, no, it's okay, it's, you know, just, just like, it's okay for Inuits to, to go kill whales, because they've done it for centuries, and this is their food source. So, it's okay for, for the Maasai to do this. But then, there, I read the story, I just loved it so much, there were these two brothers, and they were, these Maasai brothers, and they, they, uh, they wanted to go to college. And the tribe was like, look, um... This is stupid. There's no reason for you to go to college. They're not going to teach you anything worthwhile. Uh, you know, everything you need to know is here. In, in you know, with, with your people. You know, we teach you how to how to exist and be a part of the world and do all this stuff. But they're like, we want to do more, though. We want to do more. And so these two brothers, they went off and they came back with degrees. And they and and it turned out that the village was actually really proud of them. And so there was this whole thing where they're like, well, how about if we try to change the, the thinking, our, our tribal thinking about lions? Because we can't keep killing them. There aren't that many lions left. We can't say every single time uh, a boy becomes a man, he's got to go kill a lion. We've got to stop this. And so they actually became, uh, like, they, there is a, a Maasai uh, conservationist group for lions. And they, so I... Uh, these two brothers, they said that one of the one of the things that they they proposed are like, how about to become a man? There are other ways to do it. How about going to college is one of the ways you can do it. We are now men. We didn't go kill lions, but we went out and we did this great thing, and we bettered ourselves, and now we're men. So um, I just thought that was like the most amazing story, right? Like this is just so incredible. So. Um, one of the one of the so the two boys they they had um, you know their Maasai names are are difficult and uh, it, it that's one of the reasons why I struggled with what to name the character because I wanted them to be Maasai but a I, I had a really hard time finding a bank of of names it didn't seem to be like it sort of seems to be like uh, a lot of them when they uh, when they interact with uh, Westerners or, or whatever they kind of just they kind of just uh, adopt names. And, you know, I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of people who come here will do that to America. You know, they'll just, you know, hey, just whatever, just call me Steve. It doesn't matter. Like, you're going to screw up my name, just call me Steve. It's fine. Which is hilarious um, in itself because we have, um, <clears throat> in the building that I work at, we have people and um, they'll come in they'll go, oh, hi, my name is, we'll just use Steve. Steve, for example. And I'm like, yeah. oh, um, so I think I need to see your ID for us now. you win and all that. And I look their name up and, and I won't see Steve. And they're like, oh, it's actually... And I look at their ID, and I look at them, and they go, yeah. I go, okay. <laughs> and um, I've actually had the conversation with people because it's um, disappointing that people won't even, like... I don't know, even make, like, something as, like, a general attempt, you know what I mean? To try to, to try to learn a person's name. Because if you're given a name, and it's a name you've, like, gr grown up with, you you assume that person... Um, excuse me, the people you talk to would at least kind of give a concerned effort of... Hey, let me learn your name if I'm going to work with you for an X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, yeah. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and I, I do the best I can, and whenever I pronounce it, I always say to someone, um, I always say, my apologies if I butchered your name. And they all, 90% of the time, they'll say to me, like, you know, thank you for at least giving the effort. And then also, every so often, I get it right, and they'll go, oh my God, you got it right. And I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Well, there's that, so that's that's interesting. That's totally true. I mean, like people don't even trick and try, you know. But there are the, there are certain people, and um, I personally know this woman. Uh, she is from China, and I I don't even know what her real name is, and but she goes by Emma, and her explanation was she can't stand to hear her name mispronounced. It's like it goes right through her. She hates it. Yes. So. She says, just call me Emma. It's fine. Which She would rather go by a fake name than constantly hear her actual name butchered. And there was another guy that I met. Uh, he used to do IT for, for my, my day job where I work. Um, and he was actually from Kenya. And his, uh, his, his name was, was, he went by Patrick, but that was not his name. And I, I, he told me his name like once, but I don't remember it. But his last name was Kanyefe. And no matter how hard I tried to say it correctly, he would, he's like, oh, just stop talking. Every time, <laughs> at, first, at first time, at first I thought it was like, Kang Yefe. And he's like, oh, oh, God, no, no, no. And he's like, Kang Yefe. And I, and I would try to say it, and he's like, no, no, no. And, and in my hearing, I'm saying it the same. Like, I yes. really was trying. And he's like, he's like, Steve, Steve, just stop. He's like, just, no, no, just stop <laughs> you know what it's funny because i tell people right off the bat like um they'll say something to me and they'll go oh blah blah blah, blah you know xyz and abc and i'm trying to learn their name and i go i apologize i am a uh, very american <laughs> so and i and i and i can understand that too it's like you know if, if the mispronunciation of, of your name is so um, disturbing that you just like call me this and I understand that too but like yeah. it, it also comes down to like and, you know to bring everything back to the beginning it's all about respect if you want something if you want to be called something you should be called that if you know what I mean and if someone if they're like hey don't even give the effort I appreciate what you're trying to do but no call me Emma then call the person Emma if that's what they want like you know what I mean you don't need to go out of your way to be like well no I'm gonna run your name no they want to be called Emma so just call them fucking Emma like that's you know what I mean cause like you said I think I'm hearing it right in my head but to them it might sound like nails on a chalkboard exactly that was clearly what was happening with this guy from Kenya I mean just he's like no 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 that stopped don't even try it. <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny but anyway bringing it back to the, the end that's previous story so these these, these two Maasai dudes um, they uh, one of them uh, went by uh, Jackson and uh, he was a big Michael Jackson fan I guess and so he went by Jackson and uh, and uh, so in in the book in Bone Eater King a little bit of a spoiler but the, the final name you kind of get is uh, is not the the character's real original Maasai name. You never kind of learn that, but um, the the closest you get is what he went by, which is Jackson. Yeah. So I that was a like little tribute to this to this, these two awesome dudes and uh, and stuff. But yeah, I mean, hey, I think that people shouldn't be afraid to write outside the archetype of what they fall into. Like, give me a break. No, I I I don't. I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know why it doesn't happen more, but I do think it is happening more. Um, but hey, you know, in, in my, you know, in the third book, I, I, I'm just working on now that I mentioned, you know, I, uh, it's like fantasy, and so my main character, I, you know, it's it's a fantasy world, so it's not Earth, but um, I made my main character a Native American guy, so there is no America, but um, but I wanted, I don't know. Again, just kind of searching for, like, what I could do for, you know, I'm like, well, you know, how, how can I help this this very uh, typically white sort of cast? Because, you know, just like just like horror, you know, fantasy is one of those genres, but it is coming around. There's a lot of stuff. And I mean, that, you know, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, Children of Blood and Bone book that had come out last year. It's getting a movie and everything. And I mean, this, this, this woman wrote this. It's her first novel. It, it hit big. And it is sort of from uh, my wife's read it. I haven't read it, but she said it was amazing. She loved it, um, and she's not like a big fantasy reader. But um, I guess it's sort of, kind of Black Pantherish a little bit, like with the fact that it takes place in Africa, but it also has this like 
I don't know what people say, like Afropunk, or, or I don't know if that's even right for, for this particular thing, but it's, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm it's, looking at it. it, um, it, it, it. I'm looking at the uh, um, the image, the art of it right now, and <clears throat> the cover art looks what, looks amazing. What's the author's name? Uh, oh, here we go. I'm gonna butcher it just to give you a heads up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Tomi Adeyemi, A D E Y E M I. First name Tomi T O M I. So there you go. But um, yeah, I mean it's definitely uh, more and more, and I, I love. I love all these groups that I, I am seeing about, like, you know, uh, I think there's a group on, on Facebook, Black Girls in Sci-Fi and Fantasy or something like that, and they're constantly posting just kind of fan art, and it's like, there's there's a movement. There, there, there are people who hunger for this stuff, you know, and some in some cases, uh, they're hungering to see themselves in a genre that, that is woefully, you know, lacking in, in those types of characters. Uh, in other cases... And I put me into this category. I want to see it because I haven't seen it because I'm interested in it. It's different, you know. Show me, like, like you were saying, you know, the this, you know, you know, are we going to get Denzel Washington as Magneto? Is that a good thing? Like, um, or or should we just have a new character? Should there just be a character for Denzel? You know, that that <laughs> we can come up with or something like that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I'm completely against that, man. Like, I understand that some characters. It doesn't really make a difference with their like their race or whatever's being changed. Uh, for example, Spider Man. Peter Parker should remain white. I personally believe that. Same thing with Steve Rogers. But if you're going but when you make a new captain but Captain America itself does not have to be white. Spider Man does not have to be white. We've seen oh, that with, with Miles sure, yeah. We've seen it with Miles Morales and we've seen it with um, uh, Sam Wilson. But, like, if you're going to take, like, let's take Black Panther. He's from a country that's never been um, colonized. It's from a country where everyone in there is black. So, yes, you will have some pe- some um, um, people from Wakanda that are light-skinned. But for the most part, it will be, um, they'll be all be dark-skinned with, like, big dynamic hair. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. So, <clears throat> but then you get, but then you get, like, um, Bobby Drake, Iceman. Uh, when they made him gay, that made sense to me. I was like, oh, considering his relationship history, um, his insecurities, and his like inability to really like be comfortable with himself, there had to have been um, more of a um, closeted personality, for the lack of a better term. And so when he came, when they um, when he came, I said, oh, this makes sense. So it's not always necessarily a bad thing, but I just wish yeah. that when. Um, when franchises, excuse me, and companies made these decisions, they stopped and thought, like, are we doing this specifically for a dollar, and we're just basically trying to feed on the feed on the needs of people, or are we actually doing this uh, responsibly? Because I don't think Magneto and Xavier should be black. Like, you know what I mean? Um, um, Magneto's from the Holocaust. Like, you know, he's a he's a he's a Holocaust survivor. And yet, and yes, that I get that there's um there's the running debate about whether or not Malcolm X and Professor Xavier were based off of um Malcolm X yeah. and Martin Luther King. It's been debated back and forth. There's been you can get articles on both sides, but um, at the end of the day, these are the characters that they are. Just let's just let's just leave it. Why not create more black characters? Why not create other characters who specifically say, "Hey, I um I am this mutant quote unquote mutant extremist." Because I believe in the teachings of Malcolm X. And then you have a pacifist one who's like, I believe that um, only fighting when you have to or turning the other cheek. And I got that from Martin Luther King. Why not make these new characters instead of actually just um, adding something that doesn't necessarily be need, needed to be added or changed to these already classic characters? Right. And it, it, it is an interesting argument, you know, and I think people get so, so super passionate about it and, and everything. But like, I don't know, it, it is weird. Like, you know, this, you know, Ariel's a black girl now. OK, well, um, do I personally have a problem with it? No, I don't, I, don't, I don't care. But does that mean I can't see the argument of people saying like, oh, well, but but she was white with red hair. And then the counter argument to that is either, well, she's a mermaid. Mermaids could be anything or. Uh, well, but technically, it was going back to Hans Christian Andersen, so, you know, whatever, it could be, it, uh, his depiction didn't have red hair or anything either, but 
my counter to both of those is you're missing the point because they're not adapting any mermaid and they're not adapting the Hans Christian Andersen bird. They're adapting Disney's Ariel. So those those are like straw man arguments to me. Like I literally don't care that Ariel's gonna be black. That's cool. Like for the this is a lot of people happy about it. You know, on, on all sides. It's like plenty of people happy about it. Cool. Awesome. But I really think that the people who are like, but that's not what she looks like. I think I, I can't just say, oh, you're racist. Because I also agree that Steve Rogers shouldn't be a black guy. That, you know, Clark Kent shouldn't be a black guy. You know, like, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't want to see a black Superman. I, if people want to cosplay, that's awesome. But I just don't feel like that's Superman because he's, he's just not a black guy. No. So whatever. So make up a new character. And I love this, like, I posted about this a few months ago, and it got pretty heated. I posted a picture of uh, Kevin Grievous's Blue Marvel. Yes. And, and like, I this is a book I never read, so I'm not going to act like I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I, never, I never got to read this, but I do remember it coming out. And I remember, like, when Kevin Grievous, you know, the big giant guy from Underworld revealed that he was, like, like a brilliant neuroscientist or something, or a chemical biochemist or something, and he was way into comic books and was going to start his own company. It was just like, what? Okay. Um, and so, like, he comes up with this, this Superman sort of kind of character. And I got to say, like, I, even though I've never read the book, I love the look of the character a lot. I think he's really, really cool. So well, let me tell you, I think if you actually even doing a um, a five minute like. <clears throat> search on I Google about him. You'd love everything that they did with him because he he is a Superman ish, but he's also a genius. He's also um, had to go through a lot, and because he was a <clears throat> he was a character in the in the comic book lore, he was one of the first superheroes back around the time of, I think like the fifties and sixties. Yeah, and he wore a mask, and he saved the world once. And every and his mask um, came off, and everyone in the world found out that they were being saved by a black man. Oh shit! Yeah, so I think it was a, between the fifties and seventies. Imagine uh, America freaking the fuck out because they're like, "Oh, it was a black guy." You know what I mean? So the president had to say, "We um, thank you for your services, but we can't let a lot. We don't want you to continue doing this." Now imagine that, like you're reading this, you're like, "So you'd rather the world be destroyed than have it be saved by a black guy?" So, it, it's a really it was a really dope concept. It's a really deep concept, and he's actually he's completely different than Superman. He's he's got the super strength, sure. He's got the speed and all that, but he's also Reed Richard, Reed Richards, Lex Luthor level in t um, genius. You know what I mean? So there's more to him in that. So I like to, to, again back to the point. Create new characters. Um, yeah. I've said a million times that this woman, America Chavez, is going to be the biggest star in the Marvel Cinematic Universe once she debuts. And so it's like, yes, you've created, now you created a female, Latina, lesbian character. So, like, and it's not like someone created her just to, like, fill, like, um, like to check off some boxes. She's an incredible character. And I've said this on, on another show, and I go, my favorite comment from her is, the laws of physics can kiss my ass. <laughs> it, uh, who, so, I don't know, forgive me, I'm, I'm not getting the character. Is it Ms. Marvel? The new Ms. Marvel? No, um, America Chavez. Uh, America Chavez is, um, <laughs> uh, she's gone by Miss America, but I usually just call, go by America Chavez. She's a completely different character. But um, the new Miss Marvel is Muslim. She's Kamala Khan. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And I, I know people really responded to her as well. Yeah. Because she keeps... And, <clears throat> it's interesting they gave her stretchy powers because, like, you know, that was always a god thing. Yeah. It's like, stretchy powers are, you know, innately goofy, I think. And it's like, oh, no, we can't make, can't make goofy-looking girls be stretchy or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, they, they won't be sexy. You know, you know? <clears throat> and uh, what I love about it is that she's a Muslim woman. She's, like, always completely covered from like neck to foot and mm -hmm. she's a she was a fan girl so she knew um like Cap, the carol danvers was like her hero so it was an honor for her to be able to become like miss marvel um 
it was funny. There's a cover. I'll send it to you later. Where Kamala Khan is taking a selfie of her and Wolverine, and Wolverine's like grumpy, arms folded. And she's just like, "Oh my God, I'm like I'm teaming up with, with Wolverine." Like you know what I mean? It was like the funniest <laughs> thing ever. But then as like her own character progresses, she started to realize that the people she idolized are flawed. So when she when she started to look at um. Carol Danvers, who was doing something really messed up, and realized, and then also that when there's a big superhero battle, the superheroes aren't usually there for damage control, and she felt a certain way about it, and so that was um that was one of the reasons why the champions were birthed. Uh, the, the there was a uh, Kamala Khan, Vision's daughter, Amadeus Cho is the Hulk, uh, Miles Morales. It was a young Cyclops for a time, but now he's back in the past and regular Cyclops exist. Um, Riri Williams Ironheart and I'm and Sam Alexander's Nova. So I'm probably forgetting one person. But like their their mission is a little bit was a little bit different. So I like that they're taking these younger characters and while they're still holding a legacy of the classics, they're all still different people. They're all still different personalities. Like Amadeus Cho is not Bruce Banner. Miles Morales <laughs> is not Peter Parker. You know what I mean. So this is this was great. So, so you're making these characters and you're and you're giving them all these races and you're making like different races, different sexual pre- um, pre- um, preferences, different religions, and it's like okay, you've made new characters. So what you've proven to me is that this can be done, but right. you don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that that's like an amazing amazing first step. Honestly, is to make like, you know, because the, the laziest thing would just be to recast the existing character to, you know, i.e. make uh, Clark Kent a black guy. Like, Will Smith is now Clark Kent. Like, really? that, that's weird. that's one thing. And that feels like it's a cash grab and, you know, feels like it's done for the wrong reasons. Then you have uh, characters that are like what you're saying. They're new characters, but they're still banking on the success of old characters. You know, we have, you know, Riri, Riri is still... You know, Iron Heart. She's now the Iron Man analog. You know, so it's like she is her own character, but whatever. Same with Miles Morales. So uh, all these characters. So Kamala Khan having such different powers to me feels a little bit like even a step further than the others because she's not. She's she's very different. Than yes. Captain so it's not like Miles Morales who has a lot of Spider Man's powers, but with an added extra um as opposed to like Kamala Khan, who's a completely different character yes. from head to toe. And it just made sense that, like, she's a fangirl, like you said. So, like, I didn't know any of that, but, like, you know, because my, my comic knowledge, like, sort of is, is stronger in the, like, 80s, 90s sort of era. But, like, like, yeah, I mean, that that's all, that's all awesome. You know, and I, I have I have good friends that are, you know, still comic readers that, uh, that love the new Captain, the new Ms. Marvel. Love her and can't wait for her to show up in the MCU. So I mean that's really cool. That's really great. Um, yeah, but I mean, I mean they 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 did the same sort of thing with all you know before they were trying to diversify race. They would try to oh let's make a, a girl character of this. Like how many how many how many of those exist? How many She Hulks and how many whatever? Um, and I love She Hulk. She's couldn't be more different than than the Hulk. But like. You know, that sort of was a whole wave. Like, the girl versions. You know what's funny yeah. about it is now is um, she doesn't go by She-Hulk anymore. She's just Hulk. And she's a lot more Hulk-like now. But she's not But she's not the She-Hulk anymore. She's just Hulk. So they took the She part away from me, and I like that. Um, huh. I didn't know that. And there was a... I'll, send, I'll also send you this image ever, later where... Uh, Oh, I forget her real name. Um, Jennifer Walters was talking to her cousin Bruce about the Hulk, and Bruce and he was saying how he wishes that he could be her. And she went on this um, went on to tell him that he doesn't understand what it's like to be um, her because she said she went on about how she's been she's gotten into fights with supervillains, and they've used that as an excuse to cop a feel. Or when she changes from. Um, Jennifer Walters to the Hulk if she has like a nip slip or something like that there are people running around trying to get images of her naked so they can put on their blog sites and stuff like that and it okay. was and Jason Aaron wrote this and I was like fuck I never even really thought about that but again as a guy and granted these are 
these aren't real characters, but these are real issues that women have to go through. If you have a um, wardrobe malfunction, are you going to end up all over the internet? If you get in, like, if you know, if you happen to brush past some guys, you're going to try to like creepily cop a feel and things like that. So I also do love the fact that a lot of these, um, a lot of the newer writers are taking a step to um, acknowledge that these are real issues and real things going on, on top of um, being a little more progressive with the characters they're writing. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's, it's important, you know, to use your platform, you know, whatever, whatever your soapbox is, you know, use it for the right reasons, use it for good, not for the powers of evil. Um, and that, that's, that's great, you know, and these people who, you know, want to bitch about the, the SJWs and stuff, it's like, you know, you're the, you're the problem, man. If you're, if you're using the term SJW and weaponizing it, it's like, you're, you're complaining about people who are trying to make things better and people who are trying to make things more inclusive and, you know, progress forward like you know <laughs> just unbelievable unbelievable these people who would would take something like what you just said and roll their eyes and be like this is what's wrong with comics nowadays because i don't want to hear about other people's problems that are real world problems i don't want to deal with this but you know what cracks you me know, up about I mean, that is it's I like the, I remember the first time someone um told me what a social justice war and i heard the term social justice warrior i was like oh that's cool i like that and then I yeah, right. out, and I'm like, wait, that's derogatory? Like, yeah, it's derogatory. Now. It was like, <laughs> yourself, but give me a fuck. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, go, the, for lack of a better term, if like you're weaponizing social justice warrior like it's a bad thing, uh, old man Wade says, go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Right. But hey, thank you for coming on the show. Do me a favor, uh, plug everything because we we already know about the uh, <clears throat> the amazing podcast. What would you call it again? It's um very um retro. Uh, how do you say it? <laughs> so I am, I am also on an awesome podcast uh, called Retro Redoctopus. Uh, search for us on, on Facebook. Search for us on your, your podcast app of choice or on all the all the good podcast app. Like, you know, I don't know, all the stuff. The Spotify, the iTunes, all that stuff. Stitcher. And, um, and we, we talk about, like, all geeky old stuff from the 70s 80s and 90s like uh comics movies toys cartoons uh all sorts of stuff just anything that was like really fun that you kind of loved when you were a kid and you still remember fondly and and uh we say it's a celebration of all the things that made growing up awesome so again that's it's retro octopus. it's r-i-d octopus uh we kind of made up our own word it's basically like what happens what's what's more uh what's more ridiculous okay so it's like What's more ridiculous than ridiculous? Well, redunculus. Right, well, what's more ridiculous than redunculus? Redoctopus. It comes out every Tentacle Tuesday. It comes out every other Tuesday. We have new episodes, and, and uh, we have four hosts. We have a rotating host schedule. So every single time, you're going to hear a new dude uh, taking charge of that particular episode, and it's it's fun. We have a great time. We have a great Facebook group. Uh, our, our fans, are we call them Retroids, and they're, they're just a really awesome bunch, and... Uh, that it's a pretty vibrant group, so we're pretty proud of it. We're just about to wrap up our first year. Uh, we're calling it season one. We started in January, so check us out if, if if that sounds fun to you. Also, I do want to plug um, my other appearance as author me, which is Steve Ann Sampson. Um, so I am going to be at Rock and Shock once again, 11, 12, 13th. That's in Worcester, Mass, at the DCU Center. Um, I'm also going to be at the New England Super Mega Fest. That's at the Sheraton in uh, Framingham, and Framingham, Massachusetts. And that is also where I was, uh, they also have Scaracon there, and that was the con I did uh, back in uh, June with, with Derek Rook and, and Roughhouse Publishing. But this particular time, I'm actually going to be with the with my old buddies and pals, the New England Horror Writers. Uh, so it'll be kind of a fun homecoming, and uh, I'll be uh rocking out for two days on november 16th and 17th and that's the new england super mega fest so um, and there, I, there, there's some fun guests that are going to be there too and everything I, I don't remember off the top of my head but um both should be good times and you know stop by find me i uh always do sketches when i whenever anybody if you buy for me in person i always do sketches and sign books and uh free high fives all that good stuff uh i always come for the free high fives and i also love that um when i got my um 
two books. They were personalized, and I do have um, images like of the sketches he did, which was fucking amazing. And um, to the uh, the podcast, um, this is the one that really got me, and the one I always suggest to people: Castlevania slash Blood and Ye- Blood Tear Bloody Tears Years. That one, cause I didn't, I didn't. I'm not a Castlevania guy, but looking um, listening to the episode, I was like, fuck, maybe I should get into this. Um, into the the cart, the Netflix show, and like not knowing that there was no real dialogue or anything like that. But I also harken back to remember my cousin play this game, and I was just like, oh, I remember this, I remember that. You know what I mean? So, and as you said, the Facebook group is super fun. It's just a bunch of really good people who just post a bunch of like old stuff. Um, and and it's also kind of cool when you when you post something, and someone goes, oh, I remember this. Like I didn't think anybody would remember the Fantastic Max cartoon or. Um, <laughs> the uh the bedrock kid song that was stuck in my head i'm like yes and then someone posted mr bogus and i was like oh i was gonna post that but like it's kind of cool and it's really and it's really fun that like everybody on there is just really just there to be um old people in our own selves and just kind of enjoy nostalgia and like you said the things that made uh growing up awesome thanks man i appreciate that so much yeah that that's awesome i i yeah, I loved when you posted the Fantastic Max thing. I, I hadn't thought about that cartoon in years. Not Mighty Max, Fantastic Max, yes. for those who think they were talking about the wrong thing. It was a baby who had, like, space adventures. <laughs> and it, was, it was so weird, but I remember that show. I liked it. But, yeah, I mean, like, that's sort of what, what it turns into. is like everybody's posting their own experiences and things that they remember. And uh, it really does... It, 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 it does turn into a pretty good time. So anyway, but thanks for the, the Castlevania episode actually was our second episode ever. Yep. So that's going all the way back to like January. Um, but it's really funny you mentioned that one because that one is still our highest listen count ever. Really? Like all well, the episodes. And it's not like the other ones because the other ones are like, you know, we've slowly been increasing in listenership as we've gone, except for that episode. I think new people look down the list of our episodes and they're like cherry picking and then they're like oh castlevania and they listen to that one too because that one just keeps ticking up and it has like i mean almost twice as many as it has more than twice as many as many of them so let me go i'll go down the list because only 18 episodes and i'll i'll end it up you can say our goodbyes after this but so we have maiden voyage childhoods and durance uh castlevania bloody tears for years Party of One, Awesome Movies That Get No Love, which was a good one. Transformers, More Than Meets These Guys. <laughs> uh, a Time Before Stuff, Lost the uh, Lost Board Games, Collecting Dust, Star Trek, Where No Pass is, no Podcast Has Gone Before, Pac-Man Feverish, uh, Girl Cartoon Showdown, which was fucking great. I love that one. Uh, Godzilla Gaming, Start to End, Video Games That Should Have Been, Mantle of, ba- Mantle of the Batman, that was the... 30 year anniversary of the um, Michael Keaton one? Yes. Uh, the weirdest of them all. Oh, excuse me. The weirdest of them, Al, with Randy yes, Carter. There you go. <laughs> uh, cartoon comeback, TV intros, themes for, from a memory, uh, sporting, entertain- <laughs> sporting entertainment, uh, Tears in the Rain, a tribute to Rutger Hauer. So, I do episode drops uh, in a couple days, so I don't know when this episode we're recording right now. Is going to drop, but our new one is coming out in a couple of days, out, and that's um, that is going to be on the, the video game series Contra. Oh I man, I, it's funny. I not only do I remember Contra, I remember the first two and the one on Sega Genesis where they threw in like this random robot and a guy with a uh, wolf face. Dude, you know what? The, we talked about this. So you know what the you know what the werewolf's name is? Oh God, what? His name is. <laughs> the funniest name. He's like the most '90s character ever. First of all, he's a let me let me paint the picture first. He's a werewolf with sunglasses and no shirt and jeans, and and he has two robot arms, one of which is like a mini gun, right? Yeah. Like a Gatling gun. Okay. His name is Brad Fangs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brad Fangs. It's either Fangs or Fang, but his name is Brad. It's like Brad Fang or something. And the, the little robot's name is Brownie. Is like, what? What? Brownie. What a shitty name for a robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Brad Fang. Oh my god. Brad Fang and Brownie. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Oh God, uh, Steve, thank you for doing this, man. I, okay. <laughs> this is fucking like great. Uh, don't forget, um, I'll make sure I plug all the stuff. Uh, I'm gonna try to get to Rock and Shock, but seeing as how I don't drive, you know. <laughs> but I will. Uh, yeah. No, thanks a lot, man. It's a pleasure as always. I'm coming on, and uh, and yeah, hope to see you soon, man. Uh, absolutely, man. Until then, um, I don't know. Damn it, wait, I guess. Until <laughs> uh, then. Greetings. We are the Retro Reductopus Cephala Podcast, a bi-weekly show that celebrates all the things that made growing up awesome. He's right. We wax philosophic about lots of geeky crap like old video games and movies, toys, cartoons. I don't know. Help me out here. Music. Pants. Quoting video games that don't have dialogues. Shabibers. Tasty news. Unnecessarily long Japanese onomatopoeia. Butt breathers. Uncomfortable nature facts. Or how to install a samoplange. And unlike all those other podcasts, we at Retro Octopus have an exciting rotating host schedule. Do we? We sure do. So, if you didn't like the guy flapping his gums this week, like me, worry not, gentle listener. Next week, we'll have a whole new host. Of problems. Hey, they might still suck, but they'll suck differently. And you know what's really cool? Retro Red Octopus is part of the Inebriard Podcast Network with new episodes out every Tentacle Tuesday. Which is like every other Tuesday. We named it. Anyways, you can listen to us at iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or straight from the tab from doctorpuss.buzzsprout.com. Damn it, Wade!